Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Years ago, when I was practicing law in Tidewater, Virginia, one of the senior partners of the firm, one of the ones I worked really closely with, he, um, he built a house, uh, a riverfront home, and when I say he built a house, he literally built it. He, he, was a, he was quite an amazing man. He studied architecture in college and then was debating whether to go into medicine or law, opted for law after military service. So he designs this house, draws, <laughs> comes up with the drawings for it, designs this house, and then he acted as the general contractor, including participating in much of the construction hands-on. And um, it was an interesting design it had three wings, two-story wings, three of them coming out from a central atrium, and it was a large house, over 6,000 square feet. And there was a funny story. One day he brought his mother out to the construction site because he was gonna, his mom was going to live with him and his wife, 6,000 feet, three people. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, he was showing her. They, they had just framed the, the, the three sectors using steel girders, and um, he, um, he wanted her to see where her room was going to be. So he pointed and said, there's where your room's going to be. And, and then he asked her what she thought of the house. And she said, well, you know, it's fine, but aren't those people building really close by? <laughs> and she was, of course, talking about one of the other sectors of the home, thinking it was a neighbor who was building. She could not imagine a house being that big. Um, and... Uh, you know, just how big is this house would be something she may have wondered to herself. Today, we're continuing our sermon series on the book of Ephesians, entitled God's Framework for a Strong Church. And last Sunday, I noted that the term framework is chosen to connote uh, construction of a sturdy building, uh, which is what the church should be metaphorically. My senior partner used steel girders in, in his home because it was intended to withstand coastal storms that come up uh, on, on the coast of Virginia and North Carolina. The Church of Jesus Christ has withstood all kinds of storms in its 2,000 years plus existence. And it's the strongest structure there is by the power and grace of God. The New Testament book of Ephesians is one of the so-called prison letters because in the first verse of chapter 3, it says it was written by Paul when he was in prison. There's a lot of debate as to whether or not Paul was actually the author, and that doesn't really matter ultimately because God is the author of this book. Whether Paul wrote all or, or part of it or none of it, it was inspired by God and by the way, we also, it was inspired by God and whoever wrote it did so with Paul in mind. And so it has his voice in it in many respects. Today's text from the third chapter of Ephesians is one of my favorite passages of the whole Bible. And it's a prayer, which is a really interesting thing. It's a prayer, and, and, and the author says that he, is, he bows on his knees before the Father. And in that day and time, that really meant something because, generally speaking, people would pray standing up. And so he's emphasizing the intensity of his prayer, his humility before God. And so what he's praying for is really, really important, something we should pay attention to because he's praying for us. The prayer begins by asking that members of the church, of the congregation of these Ephesians, and that would extend to us now, may be strengthened in their inner being through, with power through God's spirit. Last week, we talked about the importance of a strong foundation and a building's sturdiness also rests on its internal framework, on its, its framing, its inner being, to borrow these words from Ephesians. For us as Christians, that means that we have to be made strong by the indwelling presence of Christ within our hearts. The internal framing like the steel girders used by my senior partner in the house he built have to be sturdy to withstand the test of time. And that's perhaps why the author of Ephesians prays that Christ may dwell in our hearts. 
that Christ may dwell in our hearts. To dwell is really important. It's a really intentional choice of words on the part of Paul or the writer of Ephesians. See, dwelling with somebody is not just a quick check-in. It's not just coming by and say, hey, how you doing? And it's not just visiting for a short period of time and then moving on. No, it's moving in. When you dwell with somebody, you're living with that person. So this is a, a heightened level of commitment. So when he is praying that Christ will dwell in our hearts, he's talking about Christ living in our hearts so that we can build this framework and we can grow and we can thrive. A nice home includes attention to landscaping as well as to the building. Both contribute to the beauty and value. The writer of Ephesians notes that what's important in the garden of the church is being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. That's at the heart of Ephesians, the love of Christ. So the question is, how expansive is it? Just how big is this house of God? Last week, we saw in the second chapter of Ephesians how Jesus brings peace and is peace creating one new person out of the whole as he knocked down this dividing wall between Jews and Gentiles. It would have been shocking for Jews of the first century to imagine that Gentiles were now being brought into the church, but it probably was also surprising for the Gentiles to be brought into the church. They all probably wrestled with the difficulty of fathoming what this might mean. And so that may be why the writer of Ephesians prayed that the members of the church would have the power to comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. What are the dimensions of Christ's love? Just how big is this house? And how do we recognize and experience such divine love? You know, in the past couple of weeks, I've had some, some really blessed experiences. Um, one of them was uh, a couple of weeks ago, Kristen Wren and I were driving, and all of a sudden, Chris, uh, Wren blurted out and said, it's a rainbow. And, and we, we sort of trailed it as we were going these winding roads, and it was up in the mountains, and we pulled off into this neighborhood, and it was an amazing rainbow. It was a double rainbow, and it was one that went all the way from one horizon, I mean, one touching the ground to the other. I've never seen one quite like that. We weren't running for the pots of gold, of course. No, no. But, but it was gold to us. It was gold because we were sitting there thinking and celebrating what the rainbow means according to the Bible, and also... It's just an incredible thing, the handiwork of God. Think about this God that we have who does that. What an amazing world that you can suddenly look up and there's this rainbow with all these beautiful colors. And it was stunning. And then last weekend, I, I mentioned how it was my mother's 90th birthday. So I scooted out of here on Sunday with my, and met my brother in Greensboro. We went up there and it was a nice time with my mom. But you know, one of the most amazing experiences, strangely enough, was we, were, we brought her over to the house, her, her house, our family home, and um, we, she sat there, and we, <laughs> my brother and I, weeded and trimmed like madmen because it was way overdue. We haven't been able to get up there as much with COVID and everything. And my mother is a gardener. She loves the garden. It's what she lives for, and she dreams about it all the time. But it's just a memory for her. But that day... My mother had her hands in the dirt vicariously through us and telling us, you know, I think you should take, rid of, take that plant out and move that and can you trim this back? And she was in her element. She was so happy. What a blessing that was. And then being near the coast, I haven't been able to get there that much, as I said, and uh, I, we decided, my brother and I, we needed to make a quick trip to the beach. So we, we scooted up to Virginia Beach, which is actually as close to our home as Nags Head. And uh, uh, we were in Virginia Beach before we moved to North Carolina. So that was sort of, that's home for us. And it was one of those glorious days. The water was like glass. The water was like glass. And there, we were in the north end of the beach and there weren't as many people around. And I got into the ocean and there was almost nobody around me. And I just stood there praising God. Because you see the beach, I've grown up with the beach. The beach just does something to my heart. 
And I was standing there and just praising God and, and celebrating the expanse of God's amazing creation. This is an ocean that I was standing in. And then there was an added bonus because as we were there, all of a sudden, a school of dolphins, first I was afraid they were sharks, but that was a little disconcerting, but they were dolphins going up the coastline. And all of a sudden, one of them, and he, he may have been doing this for fun, I think, at least that's how I interpreted it. It may have been to warn <laughs> the other dolphins about all the people that were there. Uh, but he started doing nose dives and backflips into the water, slapping his, his back fins, just doing that in this wonderful progression. And it was just amazing. It was just amazing and a joy to watch this display of nature. So what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ? It surpasses knowledge, as Ephesians says, of that I am certain. How can we possibly comprehend something that surpasses knowledge? Well, we can only do so if we see it with eyes of faith, with our heart, in other words, rather than just with our mind. Intellectual knowledge only goes so far. There are certain things that the mind that, that come up short when it's just in the mind. There are th certain things that only the heart can comprehend. And the love of Christ is a prime example. It may be beyond our ken intellectually, but in here we can understand it in, in a way that defies rational explanation. The key is, do we comprehend it? Do we comprehend it? For when we do, we are, as the writer of Ephesians says, filled with all the fullness of God. I comprehended God's abundant grace when looking up at the rainbow and when being the hands for my mother in the garden and when staring and standing in the vastness of the ocean. All of these gifts remain beyond my limited human understanding, but they opened the eyes of my heart to the amazing grace of our Lord Christ. But do we always experience this? Do we always experience this heart knowledge? Do we always fathom the dimensions of Christ's love? I read a book by Carrie Alice Robinson. It's entitled Imagining Abundance. And actually, it's a book about fundraising and philanthropy. But she talks about how she was at this function at Yale, uh, either Divinity School or the university, and, and Henry Nouwen was speaking. Of course, he was at Yale at, at a certain point in his life. And she was in attendance. It was an informal discussion with um, uh, members of the Catholic community. And, and Nouwen said that the central truth of your life of all of our lives is to know, to truly know, to, to know truly and completely that God loves you for who, for being, just for being you. That God loves you just for being you. And then he added, according to Robinson, that we spend all of our adult lives doubting this, talking ourselves out of this, refusing to believe it, arguing against it. But every once in a while, we experience the profound conviction of God's radical, unalterable love for us. And that is a powerful, transformative moment of grace, says Nowen, as reported by Robinson. Here's where I'd say the fullness of God is experienced because Henry Nowen also explained at the same gathering that what happens when we comprehend how much God loves us is that we yearn to return that love to God. And the way we do that, the way we thank God for God's love is by loving all of God's creation, loving one another, and loving life itself. It's a matter of seeing everything as a gift from God. That's that it's all God's way of showing us that God loves us. Our responsive impulse is then to be fruitful, which now and says is to put all we have at service to others and to God's creation. Now, I recognize that we have those days where it's hard to see with eyes of faith the rainbows and the back-flipping dolphins Sometimes we struggle to open our eyes to anything beyond our problems or worries. But what I believe Henry Nouwen 
is saying and what I think the author of Ephesians is saying to us is that when we are able to recognize God's hand in our lives, when we do comprehend the incredible dimensions of Christ's love and the power of God, which, by the way, is abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, according to Ephesians, as we heard, then we are transformed and we experience what Paul refers to as the fullness of God. Let me put it another way. I think the author of Ephesians is saying when he prays for us to comprehend the four dimensions of Christ's love, its breadth and length and height and depth, is that he wants us to realize just how mind-bogglingly great and awesome and all-inclusive Christ's love is, which brings all people into Christ, into the church, because everyone is the object of God's love. The first readers of this letter who were Gentiles certainly grasped that they had been brought into the covenant by God's grace. I don't know that we always appreciate it as much 2,000 years later because we've been on the inside for a very long time, we Gentiles. But the writer of Ephesians wants us to know that this truth that God loves us is for everyone, for everyone. None of us deserves the love that we receive from God. It's a gift to all of us. So here's the thing, if we recognize that truth, if we appreciate the dimensions of God's love for us and for all persons, as the prayer in Ephesians hopes for us, then we can and will be changed, including how we interact with others in response to God's love. As Henry Nouwen says, it will make us fruitful as we seek to return Love to God by loving who and what God has created. The comprehension of God's abundant and unconditional love motivates us to love God back by loving others. That's one of the reasons why I think it's so important for us to have a firm grasp. That's why I think the writer of Ephesians is telling us how important it is to comprehend that God loves you. I'll close with these questions. What might it mean for our church if we comprehended better the breadth and length and height and depth of Christ's love for us and for all people? How would that affect us as a congregation, if we were so attuned to the hand of God working in our lives as well as the life of this church that we were constantly lifting that up in praise? And how might we be even more fruitful than we already are if Christ dwelt so firmly within our hearts collectively that we always felt his loving presence among us? That would be one sturdy house indeed, wouldn't it? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.